Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Okay, question for you. Are you the type of person who seeks success only for themselves? At the expense of others? And that you keep it all for yourself? Whether it's your time, your money, your knowledge, your joy. Now, we all know people like that. Hopefully, we're not like that. But there may be elements within us. Um, that kind of strike a chord there. But if that's the case, then that type of person is self-centered, mean-spirited, has a negative outlook, and is very inward-looking. And the consequence of that is misery, loneliness, and emptiness, and a sense of insecurity. These are the things that flow from that kind of approach and attitude when we only think about getting stuff for ourselves, about winning for ourselves. And I've worked with lots of people like that who would, you know, the type of person who just will trample on anybody who's ruthless to get what they want and they don't care about the consequences to other people of their actions. Well, the alternative to that is the type who loves to share their good fortune, their successes, who will share their time, will share their money, will share their knowledge, will share their joy, and share their love. And if you're that type of person, <clears throat> then I want to be your friend. I want to spend time with you. And really, we all do. We all like to be around people who display those characteristics. because it leads to joy and it leads to long-lasting friendships and it builds camaraderie and there is security when you have friends and family and relationships that are built on trust when you have those loving relationships where gratitude is a key component where you're grateful for the time that other people spend with you, the friendships, the things they do for you, the way they demonstrate their love for you. That's the kind of people that you want to be with. And if you read the story about those three servants in Matthew 25, <clears throat> and that's the story where you know the, um, the boss goes away and he leaves um, one talent, uh, one, five, ten, say one pound, five pound, ten pounds, you know, with these servants, and he asks them, to invest it, to look after it while he's away. And when he came back, the guys who had invested the larger sums, who had the 10 and the 5, they'd actually multiplied it, so there was more for the boss to come back to. But the one who had only one, he just kind of buried it, sat on it, kept it, because he was too insecure, and he was afraid that he might lose it, and he was afraid of the consequences should he lose it. So he took no risk, and he kept it all to himself. And in that story, you'll see that God was really pleased with the first two, those who were generous. God loves those who are generous, those who invest time and money for the benefit of others, and not those who do nothing and basically keep things to themselves. So what's this all got to do with Elijah, you might ask? And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the life of Elijah, the trials and tribulations of this mighty prophet of God. And Elijah lived in the midst of a degenerate and idolatrous kingdom, ruled by vicious, cruel, and degenerate kings. But Elijah was called, he was one of two men, he and his successor, the other Elisha. But Elijah had a bit of a roller coaster of a life. A real roller coaster with God. 
He'd seen highs and he'd seen lows. He'd witnessed God doing mighty things through him. But he experienced real fear that had caused him to run and hide. But you see, Elijah also knew that the time would come when he had to hand over to someone else. There had to be a successor to continue the work. And at the time, he thought that he was the only one, the only God-fearing person left in the country. And then God told him, you're not the only one, Elijah. There's 7,000 others. 7,000 who had remained faithful. And he gave Elijah an instruction. He said, go and find Elisha and anoint him as your successor. So the story I want to kind of impart this morning is really about Elijah and Elisha. So in verse 19, we find <clears throat> that Elijah's moving out of this place of loneliness and discouragement, and he was restored. He had a new understanding about the way God works. And this prophet left the mountain, and he went, and he found Elisha. That was his first priority. He had to find this person that God had instructed him to, who he's going to hand, on, uh, hand over to, to continue the work. You know, God's grace is amazing. God always works to either put us on track or back on track. He always works to put us on track or back on track with one purpose in mind, and that's to make us fruitful. So like Elijah, you know, we can often find ourselves kind of discouraged, down. There are lots of people who are lonely, but you know, the Lord God, Jesus Christ, is the God of all comfort. And he's committed himself to our renewal and restoration. I remember a time um, when I came back. I'd been working in Bermuda and uh, in the four-year deal. And when I went out there, and I'll confess this, the plan was I'm going to go out there for four years and make a load of money. I'm going to come back, I'm going to pay off the mortgage, clear me debts, and I'm going to you know, retire from this, this work and do something completely different with all this money I'm going to make. Well, you know what? It was a bit of a failure because it didn't work out like that. Um, and when I came back from Bermuda, um, I still had a big mortgage, and I didn't have them wherewithal to pay it off. And the mortgage payment was something like £1,800 a month. And um, when you're facing the prospect of no income... Uh, and a debt like that on your house, it's quite challenging. And the job that I thought I was going to get when I came back, I got a call one morning to say, sorry, we've decided not to go ahead with this. So I was distraught and I was discouraged. And I think Sammy came and he was in my kitchen and I was in tears because I'm thinking, Lord, you know, what's going on here? What have you done? I've, I went with good intentions and I've come back and now I'm facing ruin. <clears throat> Two days later, I had a job. A week later, we'd remortgaged, and the mortgage payment went from 1800 down to something like 500 So, And God spoke to me in a number of ways, which I haven't got time to go into here. But as a consequence of all that, I learned a lot of lessons, and I learned a lot about myself and my relationship with God and trust. Um, and he's blessed us um, ever since, um, as he had done beforehand. But you know, we've got to make ourselves available to God's resources for renewal. In Romans 15 and 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And within the space of a week at that time, I went from being without hope to having great hope and a sense of restoration. So Elijah first went to find Elisha, and Elisha became an encouragement to Elijah the prophet. And you see, when Elijah found Elisha, he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12th, it says. 
So that shows quite clearly that Elisha was part um, of a very wealthy family. They had considerable wealth. So to obey the call, to leave behind what he was leaving behind, it meant counting his financial security as loss. He had to leave the financial security and, and become effectively a soldier of God, going into the trenches of a tremendous spiritual conflict. But Elisha's responses in verses 20 and 21 show us that he was a man of faith who was willing to do just that. So you see, to be in that position and to respond as he did, you can't spend your time. Elisha didn't spend his time just working and having fun and enjoying the pleasures that his wealth could bring him. He had to spend time with God. He had to spend time understanding God's plan, finding out and understanding God's plan for his life. So that when the call came, and he knew it was the call of God, he responded immediately. He developed his biblical values, his priorities, and his eternal perspectives. They had captured his heart, and they controlled what he did with his life. So he had the trappings of success. He had the wealth, but they didn't capture his heart. And that's the danger for all of us. So he acted on his faith by following God's call. He was willing to be uprooted from his quiet, peaceful, and rural life with all its financial security to follow the Lord. You know, I think it's really interesting to to note how many great men of the Bible were called into some special ministry after they had already demonstrated an ability and a willingness to work and where they'd also shown faithfulness and loyalty. So as Paul's just um, said in the coming series, we're going to be looking at a number of characters, um, individuals in the Bible and their characters. But Moses, for example, was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. David was tending the sheep of his father. Peter was a fisherman. Paul had a trade in making tents. And the Lord himself was a carpenter by trade who was trained by Joseph. You see, life experiences build character. And God uses all of our experiences to teach us and build us um, if we are open and willing to listen, to learn, and then to act upon it. I would say to you this, the greatest pain comes just before the greatest gain. Think about that. Your greatest pain will come just before your greatest gain. All the ladies in here who've had babies know that the greatest pain comes just before the arrival of this little bundle of joy shrieking into the world to change your life. But you forget the pain once you have that baby in your arms. I know in business, you know, when we've been pushing for a big contract, you spend a lot of time, you know, working on the project, putting things together, getting your proposal done, planning what you're going to say when you have the big final meeting. And the most nervous and uh, time, uh, difficult, difficult time is in those hours just before you go into the presentation, just before you make your pitch just before the deal is signed. I can remember it. You have time. I went um, to win a big case in Belfast uh, with a global company, and I was on my own. And it was awful, the, the nerves and the anxiety and the pain that I felt at that time. But when we won the contract, all that was forgotten. It was amazing, the joy that came following that. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, this is the point where I was going to drop on the floor and do some press-ups, but Margaret said, don't you dare. But Arnold Schwarzenegger would tell you, and when we were at the XL Men's Conference in November, Dr. Roby actually did that. He dropped on the floor and he did about, I don't know, 20 or 30 press-ups. I can do 46 to 51, by the way. Um, he dropped onto the floor and he did some press-ups. He says, don't start counting until it starts to hurt. And if you want to build muscle, then, you know, it's no good sort of, you know, doing sort of 10 reps with a weight, and then when it just starts to hurt, stop. You won't build any muscle. 
You only start building muscle when it hurts, when it starts to get difficult, because that's when you're breaking down the muscle fibers. And then as you feed them up, they grow and they get bigger to compensate for that stress that you put on them. So without that pain, there is no gain. And the greatest pain comes just before the greatest gain. Remember that in all the sort of situations that you face in life, we as a church are facing a time when we're approaching, we're trying to get this building in Lowfell. And, and we're kind of close, but as we're getting closer, the hurdles are appearing and the barriers and the obstacles, uh, which I will be sharing with the rest of the leaders later on. Um, so we need to keep praying, but we need to keep trusting and we don't quit, right? We work through it. We solve the problems. As parents, we need to teach our children to work first at home around the house and then encourage learning a trade or a profession as part of their education. Learning to work helps to develop character, faithfulness, resourcefulness, and responsibility. Um, when I was 12, my mom, God bless her, told a little white lie to the authorities because in them days you had to be 13 to have a paper round. Now, we didn't have much money, and, and I was determined to start earning some money so I could buy the stuff that I wanted to buy as a 12-year-old. So I had to go to the green in Wall's End where you had to have a medical, and, and you had to confirm your date of birth. And my mother signed a form saying I'd been born on the 2nd of August, 1954, instead of 55. So they thought I was 13 and not 12, so I got the paper lad job. And... I'm not saying this in a boastful way, but I've never stopped working since. I've worked every day of my life since 12 years old. And I'm not saying I've, been, I've loved every working day, but I like the fact that I've been able to work. Uh, and it's taught me so many things. I've learned as I've gone along. I've had lots of failures along the way, um, painful failures. But I know when I look back, those failures taught me more than the successes. My brother Gary, uh, he's seven, nearly seven years younger than me, um, he had the same kind of financial acumen built into him. So he would have little glass jars, and, and he'd put them on his wardrobe, and he'd have a, um, a name on each one of them. And he would save his pocket money until he could fill the jar with enough money to get that particular item. So he did the same. He went and he was a paper lad. He filled these jars, and when he wanted to buy a record, he took the jar with the record money, and he went and bought a record. Fantastic. That was a discipline he learned. And my brother has never been in debt. He's, he's managed incredibly well. We can't believe the kind of lifestyle that he's able to lead through hard work and resourcefulness. We should all be like that. That's what God wants us to be like. So the response of Elisha was immediate. There was no hesitation. Yes, he did say, can I go and say it's right? I mean, my mom and dad and my friends. But that wasn't him trying to back out. He was honoring his parents. And, uh, and he wanted to demonstrate, I'm leaving all this behind. I'm moving on. And I'm not looking back. There was no decision to make for Elisha. The fact of God's call, God's call automatically made that decision for him. Any other decision, you see, would have led only to futility, unhappiness, a lack of purpose in life, chasing after the wind. And so many of us do that. We miss God's calling and we go through life doing stuff, living a life, doing a job that we really ought not to have been doing. And we justify it by, well, I needed to do that to pay the bills. And so many of us get trapped into, into jobs, into, into professions that were not really God's best plan for us simply because we didn't really seek God's call. We didn't listen to what his call was. We didn't act upon it if we knew what it was. And as servants of Christ, we should never forget that we are ultimately accountable to the Lord for what we do with our lives. God uses men and women in our lives to teach us, to train us, to challenge us, but they're only instruments that God uses to point or to guide us in the right direction. We're accountable to one another to some degree, but our ultimate or primary accountability is to the Lord our God. And it seems to me that there's an important principle here. 
So one of the goals of leadership, as with parenthood, is to help people to learn to become accountable to God. That's what we are called to do. Check out Hebrews 13 and 17. Um, Elijah's, call, Elijah's call and commitment. There was a real celebration went on because the oxen and the implements, the wooden plow with the yokes um, that, that Elijah had been using represented the tools of his trade and the means and the basis of his past life. So in verse 21, he's basically declaring his commitment to follow the Lord. He was burning his bridges and counting his past as loss for the Lord that he might gain and attain the new life and ministry that God had for him as a prophet. Through the actions of Elisha, God is showing us that we need to develop an unwillingness to throw in the towel, to never say, I quit. Life and service to the Lord are like a cross-country race or a marathon. It's not the 100-yard dash, as we've heard often from this platform. And one of the greatest needs in the Christian life as fathers, as mothers, as husbands or wives or as servants in any area is endurance with the commitment. We need to be problem solvers, to work through our problems rather than quit. And Elisha was burning his bridges on his past life as he, as he set off on the journey that God had for him. So Elijah passed on everything he knew to Elisha. He wasn't insecure in his relationship with God in his own role. He wasn't insecure about sharing with Elijah, this, this young man, everything that he knew. Uh, some of the companies I've worked for put all the wrong people into senior management positions. They might have been really good at the job they were doing, and because of that, they get elevated to a management position or an executive position, which they're totally incapable of fulfilling because it's the, they've never had the experience, they've never had the training, and they haven't got the qualities that go with being a leader. And what happens is, in those situations, they will not recruit people who they think might be better than them, who they think could be a threat to them. The best five years of my career happened when I was in a position as a managing director and I had to recruit people. And I made sure that I recruited guys who I knew were better than me at doing the various things that we needed to do to make the business successful. Every one of them would be better than me. All I did was kind of harness their talents and abilities and make sure that they went in the right direction. To me, that was my role as a manager, as a leader in that situation. And I think it's, it's important that we don't get too precious about position, about title, about status. You get distracted by that. If you're a leader, then you need to constantly ask yourself, am I in the right place? Should I be leading this organization? Or is it time to hand on to someone else? Do I need to pass this to someone else? And what can I do to help that person become the best they can be for God? So he prepared, Elijah prepared Elisha to continue the work of spreading God's word amongst the people for the time when he was no longer around. And I think it's true to say that Elisha performed twice as many miracles in his lifetime as Elijah did. Pretty good student, great successor. Elijah didn't seek to hold on to something as his own. He mentored Elisha. And in doing so, he found a companion to share his life with. You know, this is uh, personal. I'll share this with you now. Um, but one of the things I'm missing right now in my life is a great friend to do life with. Someone, some a male companion, friend who I can do life with. I've got a great friend in this church who's sitting here now in Sam. But our lives are different and we're, you know, he's busy and doing things. I just feel that I would be so much better if I had a, a, a guy, a bunch of guys that I could just feel like I'm doing life with. Um, you know, in the old days when I used to go support Newcastle around the country and what were the hooligan days, and I'm not advocating hooliganism, 
but there would be 20 or 30 of us went to all the games around the country and there was a camaraderie there it wasn't just about the football it was about this sort of bonding between blokes you know and we shared jokes we we shared troubled times there, there were fights and stuff but you had you had each other's back and that's a very macho thing but but that's what it was like and at this stage in my life i'm just missing that and i think as men we need that other blokes to do life with outside of the relationships that we have with our wives and our families which are different but you see elisha played his part for Elijah because he would support and encourage his older mentor this was a two way thing it's not all about Elijah giving something to Elisha Elisha was giving back to him it's nice to have that sort of youthful exuberance to challenge you you, get, you can get complacent and stayed in the way you do things and you need that challenge from someone younger who maybe has a different perspective on life and the way things are done so it became a mutually beneficial relationship centered around their calling from God. And you know, God has placed such a call on every one of us who believe in Jesus Christ. We are followers of Jesus Christ. We're his friends, we're his children. We have spiritual gifts that are God-given. And as gifted ones... We are each to be good stewards of that which he has entrusted to us. Regarding our time, our talents, our treasures, and his truth. This requires Elisha's kind of commitment. When commitment's not there, we'll be tottering on the fence and we'll be unable to make the tough decisions needed to follow the Lord. When I was doing this and preparing and thinking about it, boy, was I convicted. I was challenged, you know. Am I willing to give up my financial security to go do what I think God's asking me to do right now? Or am I just kind of hanging on to this material stuff and finding excuses not to do what I believe he wants me to do? Well, that's something I need to work through. See what, and it's undoubtedly what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 14. We'll not go into that now. But he was setting out the conditions and the cost of being a follower of his. There is a cost to following Jesus. And there's three conditions mentioned in Luke 14 which deal with the necessity of total surrender. Arnold Schwarzenegger stars in that film Total Recall. He needs to do a movie called Total Surrender. Without total surrender, we cannot be his disciples. We simply will not be able to make the sacrificial decisions that following him will require. Now, if the band want to come up, um, I'll be finished in a few moments. Um, I often talk about Dennis Tinarino when I'm up here because he's the best example that I can think of, that I know personally, of someone who was totally surrendered and totally committed to doing the will of Jesus Christ in his life. He gave up everything. And he walked into a room and he would share the good news of Christ with anybody and everybody. And he had this charisma which was Holy Spirit induced about him, which drew people to him. Miserable faces turned into smiles when he walked into the room. This was a great man of God. And he's someone who I see as an example and someone I would very much like to even be just a little bit like him would be amazing and he was like Christ so what all this means for us this morning is that we need to reevaluate our values our priorities our attitudes and our pursuits but above all, we need to answer the question, who and what is the source of my faith? Is it the Lord? Do you, do I truly believe that he will be all that we need? Or is my faith really anchored in the details of life? Pleasure, position, 
power, prestige, possession. And that's a real challenge to me as I look at my life and the things that I do with it. Am I re- is my faith really anchored in the Lord or is it anchored in the pleasurable things that I do, the position that I hold, the power that I might have, the prestige with my role and my profession, the possessions that I have? Would I be willing to give them up Tomorrow, if God said, here, Terry, this is what I want you to do now. I stand here honestly and say, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what my answer would be right now. I hope and I pray that God will give me the faith to leave all those other things of life behind and focus on him. Elisha, like Elijah, was an ordinary man, but he became an extraordinary man because he was available to the Lord, because he turned his life over to the Lord, lock, stock, and barrel. And God was able to use him in tremendous ways because of it. So let's challenge ourselves to become more like Elijah and Elisha and develop total commitment to the Lord and one another. Then we'll not only change Gateshead, but we'll change the world for good. Thank you. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.